Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Um, the weekend after Easter will be our nine-year anniversary, and we have like a whole amazing thing planned out. But how many know that it was the people that started this church in 2010 with us. There was people that were faithful, that were committed, that had a heart for God's vision that helped literally carry this ball forward to now 2019. And for those of you that just started coming here, whether it's been a year or whether it's been two years or whether it's been a week, you also have been given a mantle to be a part of a team, to be a part of God's team. And God wants us to continue to push not only our, our families forward, but God wants to push your kids forward. I know that there's been something very unique about Elevate Church. For whatever reason, it just seems like our youth are the ones that end up bringing the parents to church. Our youth are the ones that actually end up inspiring their parents to serve. Our, our youth, when we started Elevate Church, our worship team started with a bunch of youth. That's how this whole thing began. But it started with people that had a heart for God's vision, God's mission, God's plan for the city of Newhall, for the city of Santa Clarita, and beyond. And how amazing is that? That because we have been a church that has come together, though we started with 12 people, that we've seen God just continually bless this church with people that have a vision and a heart to take the gospel of Jesus Christ into all the world and to begin to bring hope to different places. I mean, who would have ever thought, like from 2010 to 2019, that we have teams that go to Oaxaca, Mexico. In 2020, we will be opening Elevate Church Japan, you know it, and there's other places that God is calling us to. Who would have said, and it all happens because God has literally shown vision to people in this house. God has literally helped people unfold their divine purpose and plan on this earth. And it's all because, you know what, when Jesus said, I will build my church, he, don't, he doesn't lie. He says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God will build his church, and he'll do it with us or without us. But I want to be team church. How about you? Man, I want to be a part of everything he does, but you have to have heart. Um, I remember when I was in high school, uh, I was playing football, and I know I'm carrying a basketball, but I was playing football, and, uh, and I made it to varsity. I was a junior, made it to varsity, and uh, I was a, a kicker. And I was a pretty good kicker. I've always been very competitive in sports. And, uh, and I'll never forget, we were having a scrimmage game amongst ourselves, amongst, you know, just some local people. And while we were playing, there was this one guy that was just being lazy. Like, I mean, he was literally just not in the game. He would show up to practice. He would, you know, be there physically and, 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 uh, and, and talk to us and connect with us. But when it came down to playing the game, he just kept dropping the ball. He, would, he wouldn't do the plays. And it's like, where are you going, bro? What, what, what's going on with you? And I finally, of course, in high school, I wasn't a good boy. I was really bad. You know, I spoke with my fist a lot. And I went to them like, dude, what's your problem, man? Like, are you, are you here to play or what, what's up? And, and I'll never forget his response. He said, well, my heart's not in it. I'm like, then why the heck are you playing then? And he said, well, because my dad is the one who told me to, to, to play football. And, of course, you know, you can tell that he wanted to, you know, please his father and just do it for his dad. And I, I'll tell you, there's something about having your whole heart in something. There's something about being committed. There's something about putting your life into something that's bigger than you and I. But as I tell you that story, let me tell you what the church looks like. I think that the church looks similar to my story because I believe that there are so many Christians that genuinely love God, that genuinely, you know, honor God, that respect God, but we can easily come to the place where we look at serving God as a duty rather than a privilege. And so I know that many of you here, which we have a good, a good percentage of people that serve at Elevate Church, and I'm speaking to both, the ones that are not serving today, the ones that are maybe you're not connected. This is not to shame you today, please. As I speak today, I want to talk to you about your heart. I want, I want to talk about the heart that you have for God. And for those that are already connected, I want to talk to you as well because it's so easy. You know what the temptation is for volunteers is to lose the respect for your team and to lose the respect for your position and to lose the respect for the idea that God has given you the opportunity to serve him. 
It's so easy to lose sight of that. It's so easy to di- just get all, you know, uh, distracted with, with even the enemy's lies concerning other people that love you and that care about you. So my heart today is that, that we would be a church that, that serves God passionately, that we would be a church that does not shrink back, that we would be a church that does not compromise but that we would really stand up and that we would be firm in the faith and that we would take the vision that God has given us. If you call Elevate Church your home, then we have to treat it like it's our home. That means that we all put our hands to the plow and we serve God faithfully. Let me show you a verse because Jesus is talking to his disciples and he, he, has, a, he has a problem with the, with the church for a minute. And he says this in Matthew 15, 8, he says, These people draw near to me with their mouth. And they honor me with their lips, but their, their what? Hearts are what? They're far from me. And so it's so easy to come to church and we give lip service. We give mouth service like praise God, amen, pastor, right? We can have that whole Christianese language and, and sound like we're, we're in it to win it, but our hearts can be far from doing the mission or doing the will that God has for our life. And I'm praying that as we're in this series that, that we're, we're, we're reflecting, that we're checking ourselves, that we're examining whether or not we're even in the faith anymore, whether or not we trust God in, 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 in his word. When he says that when you serve him, he, he says, if you build my house, I build your house. But how many of us honestly and genuinely believe that, that when you put your hands to God's purpose when you put your hands to God's house when when you begin to put your heart into God God will bless your family in a supernatural way and we don't serve to get we serve because he's already done so much for us he has saved us he rescued us he delivered us he has set us free from so many things that I'm sure that some of us are even ashamed to talk about but how many know that when God served you he had no shame He had no reservation. God didn't apologize when he served us. When he he was on that cross, he wasn't apologizing for him being completely stripped naked, ripped up, like bleeding everywhere. He said, I'm doing this because I love you, because I serve you, right? And Jesus said, I didn't come to to be be served. I came to serve. And, And if that's the heart of the father, then that should be the heart of his kids, that we have a heart to serve God, that we would not be lip service people, but that our hearts would be so connected to God that the conviction in our life is what compels us, that the love of Jesus to see what he did for us would compel us to literally come to the place where we're saying, God, whatever you ask of me, I will do it, and I'll do it with all my heart, not half of my heart, not a portion of my heart. Like when I say I'm all in, I'm all in, God. I'm not perfect, but I'm all in. Amen? Can we give the Lord a hand clap for being so good to us? And so I love the fact that we can look back at 2010 and see many people that still attend here, at they still attend Elevate Church, that literally paved the way. Well, in the Bible, God has placed so many men and women that we can learn from. Like, you look at their life, and and their, their, their life have become our lessons. And there's someone in the Bible that is, is, is mentioned as much as Jesus. So you have Jesus, obviously. There's so many verses that talks about Jesus from, from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. But the second most mentioned person in the Bible is David. David was the second most mentioned person. And I love that because when you think about David, David has so much to say. When you read the book of Psalms, you begin to see how he expresses his life. And then after David, the next person that's mentioned so much in the Bible is Abraham. Abraham is mentioned in 14 chapters of the Bible. Like, Literally, you begin to see his story. After Abraham, it's Joseph. Joseph also had 14 chapters in the Bible that begins to show you the model of his lifestyle and how he served God. And and these two men, 
Abraham and Joseph, you see their life in Old Testament and New Testament. And then you have Elijah, the prophet. He has 10 chapters that talks about his life in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But what was very interesting is I was studying and preparing for this. When you, when you see David, David has 66 chapters in the Old Testament and New Testament that tells us about his life. I mean, it starts from, from when he was a little boy to when he became a youth to where he became a young adult to where he became a family married man to where he fell to where he became an old man and then eventually he died. He's the only one. And in the New Testament, he is mentioned 55 times. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that obviously God wants us to learn something about David. Why? Because God gave him and only him a title that no other person ever got. And you know what that title was? That he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that was what? After God's own heart. So the reason that God, after Jesus spoke so much about him was because God wanted to give us an example, a model of what it looks to be a heart servant. Someone who really seeks to honor the heart of God. Someone who, who wants to be broken like God's heart is broken for lost people, broken people, sick people. We need to get back to the place where we have a heart like David had and so you read the scriptures and you see all the the the, the ups and the downs and the all arounds and I love the fact that God chose someone like a David who messed up pretty bad didn't he and and we know what he did right he 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 looks at a girl through the you know his bedroom window he should be in battle he decides to stay home he's chilling out and he sees a girl named Bathsheba taking a bath and all of a sudden he says oh she's fine and he has, the, he has one of his guys, hey, go get her. And he brings her, and we know the story. He commits adultery. Uh, he finds out that she's pregnant now and that she's got a husband. So what does he do next? He murders the husband. He puts him on the... So you got David, who is an adulterer and a murderer. And God is using him as an example. You know what that tells me? That tells me that you and I can be so jacked up, messed up, that God can redeem your life, no matter how bad you may have had it. That God can restore you. That God can utilize you. Now, now don't get it twisted. David paid an ultimate consequence. Man, that man went through hell with his kids. I mean, there was some some severe perversion that took place in his family. I mean, there was a lot of loss. But one thing that you can see about David is that David was broken because of his sin. His conviction literally got him to the place where you read all throughout the book of Psalms where he says, Oh, dear God, create in me a clean heart. Place in me a steadfast spirit. And what the enemy does is he'll take your sin. He'll take your flaws. He'll take your mess-ups. And he'll begin to turn them into guilt, condemnation, and shame. And then you wonder, why can't I have a heart for God like that person? Why can't I love Jesus like they love Jesus? Why can't I worship Jesus the way? You know why? Because God wants to bring us back to the place where he says, Hey, listen, you trust me with your heart, and I'll heal it. You trust me. Why do you think in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, it says, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And so we have to come back to that place where we're saying, God, we need to, we need to get this heart healthy again, spiritually. We need to get our act together. Because God is looking for people that have a heart to serve him and to serve his will. Look at what 2 Chronicles 69 says. This is pretty amazing because God is in search for people with a heart. A heart after God's own heart. Look what it says. It says, for the eyes of the Lord, they run to and fro throughout the whole earth. That means God is still searching, guys. God is searching right now throughout this whole earth. 
to show himself strong on behalf of those whose what? Heart is loyal to him. I, you'll never hear me say, I need you to be loyal to me. I don't believe in that. I believe that if you're loyal to Jesus, you'll be loyal to me. But if I put the pressure on you being loyal to me, I know you're going to fail. And so God's looking for some loyal hearts. God's looking for some committed hearts. God is looking for a people. He's searching to and fro all the earth. He's just looking like, where can I find someone that would be like an Isaiah? Like, God, you don't need to look any further. Choose me. Pick me. I'm right here. Use me. But you don't see those type of hearts anymore. Why? Because we have this attitude today in our world of, of this self-absorbed, we're so self centered right we're so consumed with our own issues our own problems that's why god said guard your heart with all diligence because out of that little beautiful heart flows the what the issues of life and isn't it the issues that keep us from having a loyal heart it's the issues of our heart that keep us from serving god it's the issue of your heart if you're not careful you can live the rest of your life and never fulfill god's divine plan for your life and that, you don't want to regret. I remember when I was dying in a hospital. I remember very clearly. I wasn't afraid of dying. But you know what, what really gripped me with fear? I, for so many years, was running away from God. I didn't want to. Like, God would give me opportunities to preach, to teach, to help. And I was so fearful of man. I was a man pleaser. I was afraid to step out for God, and I would always make excuses. I would even lie to my pastor and be like, no, 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 you know, uh, I, I, got, I have to work. I, I would make up all kinds of lies. Liar, liar, pants on fire, right? And, and, and I remember laying in that bed, and as I was, the doctor saying, you got 50-50% chance of dying. I, you know, we don't know how this is going to go for you. And the only thing that literally gripped me with fear is that I would stand before God. And have to answer for my lack of having a heart to do his will. That's what I was afraid of. Because you know what? You can tell God every excuse under the sun of why you weren't willing to give him your complete heart. But God's going to be like, hey, listen. I believe he's going to show us a screen over here. And he'll be like, look, this was the life I planned for you. But this is the life you lived. And so God's saying, I need hearts I need sons. I need daughters. I don't want slaves. And so many of us were slaves to sin. We're slaves to doubt. We're slaves to depression. We're slaves to anxiety. We're slaves to so many things. But once again, we have a God who heals, a God who restores, a God who redeems. Just think about the emotional st stability that David had. Think about it. This guy messed up. He messed up severely. But he trusted God in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all his losses. He still had a heart after God's own heart. We can't lose that church. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. And so uh, we know that David had flaws and we know that he committed all kinds of sins and everything. And we know that he paid the consequences for his sin. And we know that we also through Jesus Christ, as we put our faith in him, we are also redeemed, forgiven. We know all that. But look at what happens. The children of Israel, they, they have experienced the goodness of God, the love of God. He, he delivers them out of Egypt. We know that story. So he does great miracles in Egypt. Then he parts the Red Sea. I mean, he literally brought them through the best sea world experience, literally. I mean, just imagine they're walking in the middle and watching all the sharks, the whales, and like, whoa, they're walking across the, the, gr the greatest aquarium you've ever seen. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and then they're in the desert, and God is providing for them. He's providing food. Uh, water, clothing, their clothes, they didn't even go, you know, sour. The moths did. They had perfect clothing. Like every, God provided everything. Then they come to these walls called Jericho. Remember the story of Jericho? And, and there was walls that, that were keeping them out from stepping into what God was giving them. What does God do? God then brings the walls down and he brings them the promise. And then you keep reading story after story how God delivered, how God did mir mighty miracles, signs and wonders. And you know what happens to Israel? What happened to Israel, the, the children of God, is what happens to so many of us of today. 
they got mad at God. They started complaining. They started bickering. And they came to the place where they said, you know what? I don't know if I want to serve this God anymore. And they have a change of heart. Why? Just because you go through stuff. Just because you go through challenges. You have a change of heart. This is what's happening. Let me show you because maybe you're sitting here today and you've had a change of heart. Like there was a time where you completely trusted God. There was a time where you were all in for God. There was a time where you were like, God, it didn't matter what I'm facing. You're faithful. But maybe now you've gone to that place without even knowing where maybe you've have forfeited. Listen, Jesus is not only your Savior. He's not only your King. He's your Lord. And, and, and we want him to be Lord over all. And that means that we don't pick and choose what he lords over. Now look at this. So the children of Israel are, are, are complaining to, to, uh, to the prophet Samuel. And look what they say in 1 Samuel 8, 5. It says, look, they told him. This is the, pe the people of Israel. They said to Samuel, look, uh, you're now an old guy. You're old, bro. You're getting old. You ain't working for us. And they said, and your sons, they're nothing like you. He says, they said, give us a king. Everybody say, give us a king. Us a king. That's dangerous. You got to be careful when, when you put a demand. They said, give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. In other words, these, these people were so diluted. They were so worldly that they couldn't see that God literally had separated them for something special, unique, for something that was different. But the children of Israel wanted to look like the rest of the world. Like give us what the world has. Give us whatever. We want to look like them when God doesn't want us to look like anyone. God wants you to be unique. Do you realize that the power of God will only flow in your true identity? The power of God will flow in who you really are. But too many of us are focused so much on what we want to be, right, instead of accepting the fact that this is who God called you to be. And we struggle with it. And so here they are, they're like, give us, give us, give us a king that's going to judge us. Give us, we want to look like the world. And I pray that Elevate Church would never, ever crave to look like anything else but, but what he called us to. That we would never crave to, to compromise just to, just to be hip or to be cool or, or, or to relate or to be seeker sensitive because we, we're afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit or we're afraid to lay hands on the sick because what are, what are the, the, the people going to say about us? I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's making sure that we keep a heart that still believes in the power of God, that still believes in the Holy Spirit, a church that still believes in holiness, a church that still believes in righteousness, a church that still believes that God can move in a miraculous way, a church that still believes in miracle signs and wonders, that we would never lose that for the sake of wanting to look like everybody else. I'm trying. <laughs> it's a dangerous thing when we want to be like everybody else. It's a dangerous thing. Look at 1 Samuel 8, 7. So look at what God tells Samuel. He says, hey, listen. Do everything they say. Okay, be, be very careful. Look at this. So they said, we want a king. I, I think that the worst judgment that God could ever give any of us is to give you what you want. And how many know you can do what you want to do, and eventually God will give you up to your own way. And so God tells Samuel, hey, listen. Do everything they say to you. Give it to them. The Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. We must be careful that we don't come to the place where you only do what you want. We got to come back to that place. Why do you think Jesus, God gave us Jesus as the example. He's in the garden. He's suffering. He's in pain. Is anybody suffering right now? Well, guess what? God showed us that even in suffering, you still have the ability to say, but not my will. Let your will be done. See, that's the heart that God wants for his kids. 
that regardless of what you don't have or what you desire, I don't want what I want. I want what God wants. I want to have a church that desires what God wants for our life, whatever plan that is. I don't know what size this church is ever going to be, honestly. This church may be in the next 10 years. It could be a mega-sized church. I don't, I don't know, but let me tell you something. I'm not going to stress over that. I just want to be the church that God has called us to be. A church that is waiting for Jesus to come back and take us all up to heaven. Right? A church that is not shrinking back. A church that is not making an excuse for seeing the power of God. I don't want to be that church that just wants to look like everybody else. And I pray and hope that neither do you. That you wouldn't get so comfortable that you're just okay with the status quo. But that you're constantly growing in the things of God. That you're developing a heart with character. I get it. There's so much skill, okay? There's so much skill. There's so much talent in this room alone. But let me tell you something. We've heard all, I, I, I'm, I've heard it, you've heard it. You say, you hear people say, I'd rather have someone with heart than with skill any day. Have you ever heard that statement? Yeah. But you know what? I, I don't believe that. I want, I want heart and some skill, you know? I think too many Christians say this, like, well, I love Jesus. Okay, but the Holy Spirit has a brain and he's intelligent. You know, and, and we should develop our skill sets. We should develop our talents. Not be that person, well, I just love Jesus. And, you know, no, let me tell you something. If you're a child of God, if you're a son of God, we should be the most brilliant people. We should be the most brilliant business people. We should be the most brilliant in everything that we do. Whether you're in, in the, uh, you know, you're in the movie industry, you're brilliant. You're an attorney, you're brilliant. Anything that you do, you're brilliant. If you're in medicine, you're brilliant. If you're in media, you're brilliant. Man, if you flip burgers, you're brilliant. Last week, we talked about being an exceptional person, right? And so here's the deal. God, God, God wants us to not only have a heart, but to have a heart with a sharpened skill set. And here's why. Because the skill and the talent was free 99 for you. It didn't cost you anything. You think, you're, you think that your skill set is is only what you develop no god started by placing that skill set inside of you and then you developed it but god's call has always been inside you but let me tell you something i can teach skill but i can't teach heart you either have heart or you don't amen so that gets developed you know how it gets developed through trials you know how it gets developed through pain you know how it gets developed when people deceive you, when people lie to you, you know how that heart gets developed? When people are, are against you, when people stab you in the back, in the front, on the side, I don't know, in the toe. That's, that's where character, you know why? Because out of that will flow the issues of your heart. You're either going to say, Lord, I forgive, or you're going to become very bitter. And you're going to blame God and be very resentful. And then you'll go years and years living under this cloud of victim and, 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 and shame or guilt. And you'll never rise to the occasion that God has created for you. And God wants to change that. He loves this house. And so he says, they don't want me to be their king any longer. When you refuse to be healed, when you refuse to accept God's word, you are basically saying, I don't need him to be king over my life anymore. I got this, and that's dangerous. And so God went ahead, and he gave them exactly what they wanted, and we know what happens, right? So God gave them the worst judgment. He gave them what he wanted, and he gave them a guy by the name of what? Saul. And so we know the story, right? Samuel goes out, and he's looking for a king to anoint, and he sees this guy named Saul, and Saul had not a six-pack. He had a 12-pack, you know what I'm saying? And, and he was good-looking, and you know, I mean, this guy was probably on, on, on Vogue magazine, and, and he looked good. He looked sharp. Why? You know what? Well, we know in the story later on, God corrects Samuel, and he says, hey, listen, while you look at the outside, I look at the inside. And there's so many of us that we're so quick to look at the outside, talent, skill, looks. But I have, I have noticed, kind of like the whole high school thing, have you ever heard when you graduate in high school, uh, most likely to? succeed most likely to be the cutest couple most likely to and you have all those right but i believe that god has a different book as well somewhat like that and he picks most likely to be unqualified most likely to be not the best looking most likely to not have all the skill sets most likely to 
Those are the people that God chooses, not always, but most often, here's why. Because those are the people most often that have a heart for God. I think people that are blessed generously with skill are the ones that tend to stay away from serving God. They do. I've been around. I've been around many big influencers in church. And, and I can see the heart sometimes. They have so much skill, but they have no heart. They won't, they won't serve a day. They won't help. They'll, they'll come and they'll sit and they'll receive. And they're wonderful people. They have great hearts. They love Jesus. But how many know that God's not looking for lip service? God's looking for a heart that's willing to follow him at whatever expense. That means that we have to be committed followers of Jesus Christ. And God's looking for those kind of people. And so here you have Saul. He finds this guy. Uh, uh, Samuel finds Saul. He anoints him king. And we know what Saul does. You know what he does, right? He, he starts having the most highest taxes upon the children of Israel. He then starts looking at their properties. And he starts taking their properties away. Then he starts taking all the girls from the families of Israel. And he started using them as his servants and having sexual you know, stuff with them. Then on top of that, you see that here you have Saul. He's sending all the, the boys, the men. He's putting them in the front line for battle. And so these families, Israel was losing everything. When you choose what you want, you will lose everything. You will. And so Saul came. And, and of course, Saul didn't start that way. Saul started with a heart that at least honored God. But eventually, he allowed his skill he allowed his power, he allowed his talent to change his heart. And then we know what happens. The same children of Israel that were complaining, give us a king, are the same people that now are blaming God. How dare you give us this kind of king? How dare you put a man like this in our life? How, and, and you know what the reality is that we're so good at pointing fingers, but the difference between Saul and David is that David took responsibility for his actions and Saul didn't. David was like, God, forgive me. You know what? I've messed up. And, and maybe you've been someone that's just kind of been wandering around and not really committed or, 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 or really, you know, going all in for Jesus. It's not to condemn me, but it's to come to that place of conviction and say, Lord, forgive me for having that attitude. You've blessed me with all this gift, all this talent. God, I give this talent back to you. I give this gift back to you. I give my life to you completely, and you watch what God will do with your life. And so we know that then... Um, and God answers their prayer. God's so merciful, huh? And he says, okay, Samuel, come here. I got someone ready for them. And it's David. And so he goes in and he anoints David. The problem with David is that he's running from Saul because Saul wants to kill him. And um, look at this. I love this. In, in, in Psalms 25, as he's running and he's, we see David is running and he's got all kinds of issues and and, and, and just look at his heart. In, in Psalm 25, verse 5, this is a song he wrote. He said, lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. And we know that this came from that place of, of him being so wrecked from, from the poor decision he made of, you know, it, sleeping with that girl, committing adultery, murdering that, that husband of hers. And he's finally in this place where he's saying, God, forgive me. Forgive me for the actions I've taken. And, and, and all day long, I'm going to put my hope in you. And I, I love this because when, when you look at the, the, the kind of person that God's looking for, he's looking for this kind of person, a man that genuinely has a heart for God. And so look at 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 through 2. It says this. It says, And David left Gath, and he escaped to the cave of uh, Adullam. And his brothers and the other members of his family heard about it. So they went down to join him. Now check this out. Look at the team that God gives David. Everyone who was in trouble, he gave them. Everyone who owed money. Everyone who was unhappy. How would you like to have that kind of team? He says he put everyone who was in trouble, everyone who was in debt, and everyone that was unhappy. I mean, what kind of team is that, right? He says he surrounded David with all those kind of people. But look at David's heart. David wasn't concerned about their trouble. David was not concerned about their debt. David was not concerned with them being unhappy. David was concerned about them. 
and the same men that were troubled, the same men that were in debt, the same men that, that really had nothing going for them. He says, and everyone who was in trouble or owed money or was unhappy gathered around him, and he became their commander, and about 400 men were with him. So think about 400 men. Think about our church. Think about how many of us there are. God's not concerned about how broke you are. God's not concerned about how much trouble you're in. God's not concerned about how far you may have fallen. All God wants to know is your heart with him. That's it. And together, we can do so much. Together, we can literally continue to change our city, our community. Together, we can change the world. When we're up here and we're saying we're going to change the world, we're not just talkers. No, we're heart people. We do it. And we all pay the price, and we go all in. And so here you have David, who, who's running. But look what it says in verse 5. But the prophet Gad spoke to David, and he said, Don't stay in your usual place of safety. Look at your neighbor and say, Stop being so comfortable. Yeah. Listen, it's true. I think that there are so many great, wonderful Christians sitting in here today that you know that you've been so comfortable. Listen, if you don't serve, you swerve. That's the truth. What was David doing? God called him. God anointed him. What did he do? He swerved into the cave. What are you doing in there? Well, Saul's Saul's after me. I anointed you. I equipped you. I called you. Do you remember Goliath? I was with you. Do you remember when you were bold? Do you remember when you were bold enough to tell that giant... You know, you uncircumcised Philistine, who are you to come against the armies of God? Did you forget that I was the God who was with you? But so many of us today, we know that, you know God's healed. You know God's done amazing things. And we're no different than some of these people where when you don't serve, you swerve back into the cave of depression. You swerve back into the cave of doubt. You swerve back into the cave of I'm not good enough. You you swerve back into the cave of I'm not qualified. And, And let me tell you something. You're not going to change any person's life while you're in the cave. And God is saying, get out. I didn't call you to cave ministry. He didn't call you to cave ministry. God called you to be a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. He called you to be the light of this world, the salt of the earth. God has already predestined us to do great and mighty things for him. But we got to get out of that cave. And we got to make a decision. And God's like, okay. David, you already did your running. Stop the noise already. Come out. You've been comfortable in those comfy chairs out there at Elevate Church too long. (laughs) Been sitting there every week and you hear messages and you're being inspired and you're being stirred, but you're still not getting out of the cave. And God's saying, it's time. It's time for the church to step up. Look at Acts 13, verse 22 through 23. This is the Apostle Paul talking about David. He says, and when he had removed him, he removed who? When God removed Saul. It says, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will, not some of my will, who will do all of my will. How many want to do the will of God, honestly? You want to do all of the will of God. Okay, well then, guess what? You're going to have to come out of the cave of comfort. You're going to have to come out of the cave of safety. You're going to have to make a personal decision. Listen, we have many areas to serve here at Elevate Church. There's so many places to serve in, and everyone looks different. Some, listen, we have people that just like one one specific gentleman, you know what? All he does in serving here is he prays for our students in Oaxaca, Mexico. Like that's his ministry. He just intercedes, intercedes, and of course, he's a big giver. He loves to give to our children in Oaxaca, Mexico. He provides all kinds of stuff for them. And he says, Pastor, that's how I serve my house. That's how I serve my church. I'm going to be the one who stands in the gap and who prays for those kids every single week. And for two years, that man has not stopped praying for them. I even printed out all the pictures of the kids and I gave it to him. I said, okay, I want you to see their faces and you begin to declare and prophesy over those kids. That's how, so there's different, or maybe you want to be an usher, a greeter, a park and greet person. If you think you're too big for that, you know what? Start cleaning toilets. It it, it will. It'll bring your heart back to a place of humility, 
right? And you'll be like, God, it doesn't matter where I serve. Place me wherever you want. Not my will. Let your will be done. You know what? And, and maybe you're already someone here. You're like, man, pastor, good message. I'm glad you're telling them that. No, I'm talking to you too. Because <laughs> some of us have gotten so comfortable in serving that we've lost respect of the position God blessed you with. And you don't honor it anymore with a heart, a pure heart. It's more of a task. It's more of a duty. It's more like you wake up like, oh, great, I got to go to church. You know, it, and that happens. I know. I've been in ministry long enough. I've seen it all. And so we got to come back to the place and say, God, please forgive me for having that wrong spirit, having that wrong heart, treating my church like it's an afterthought. No, this is the place where God healed me. This is the place where God brought me. This is the place where God has restored me. This is the place where God has spoken to me. Why am I not honoring the place that God has brought me, the place that God has healed me in? Why am I not honoring the place where God feeds me, where God encourages me, where God empowers me? You know what? As a servant, as someone who's maybe been serving for many years, your temptation is to lose respect for those who serve alongside with you. You don't, you don't longer see them the same way. You used to respect them. Now you don't, you don't respect them for who they are. And so when I'm talking about the heart issue, I'm talking about all of us. It, it goes to me too. I can't be the pastor that says, I wish I had that kind of church. No, I have to love the church that God gave me. Some of you, you're like, I wish I had that kind of family. Well, guess what? That kind of family is not the family God gave you. So learn to love the family that God gave you. Learn to love the kids that God gave you. Learn to love the lane that God has given you. If not, you're going to keep looking at other people's lanes, and one day you're going to blink, and you'll be 50, 60, 70 years old, and you still have done nothing. All you did was dream about someone else's lane instead of taking hold of the lane and the call and the blessing that God has placed on your life and none of us have the same call we all have a special place in the body of Christ every single one of you some of you you're good at writing we need writers some of you you know you're good communicators some of you you have great leadership you're in business use it for God's glory don't just keep sitting down get connected come on let's let's build God's house Jesus is coming back he's coming back and he's going to to take accounts accounts of what you did with your life for him what are you going to say I, I started that business I, I bought those two houses I got those, those beautiful cars and that nice boat uh, I got a great family no listen <laughs> that's the added blessing you're confusing it God's saying but what did you do for me what did you do for building my house what did you do in advancing my kingdom what did you do with the gift and the talent I gave you? Was it solely for your purpose, for your own desire? Or did those gifts also honor me? Did they bless me? And I believe that every single one of you have a heart to bless God. I really believe that. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.